I initially pirated Ultra Kill, but it turned out to be so good that I had to buy it. Farewell, citizen. And the best part is, I'm not the only one with that sentiment. You probably clicked on this video knowing Ultra Kill as... But it used to be more like this. Random fall, pick up the gun, title screen, and look, it's a little baby Cerberus. Aw, kill it now. Ultra Kill has been in development for some time now, and throughout these years, it changed incredibly. The initial idea for Ultra Kill was about some schizo guy going through a spaceship as he slowly started to become more schizophrenic. The robot idea didn't come into play until way later down the line. We tragically almost never got V1 Breedable Edition. It might be strange to hear this, knowing how popular the game is right now. Across his 7 hour video, which I had to watch for the sake of this video, he states how he isn't as much of a good game developer or writer as a lot of people make him out to be, which gives him the imposter oh, syndrome. Oh, oh, oh. The creation of the game and its story is a series of happy accidents as we are going to cover in this video, and let's just say, the amount of coincidences that led to this game being way deeper than Hockey Day intended is mind-blowing. You should do it for yourself now! The humble beginnings of Ultra Kill can be highlighted with its first ever developer's note, which was published on Hakita's YouTube channel six years ago. So you might be asking to yourself, what is the point of this very, very inflated video? Essentially, I became very fascinated with the arena shooter genre after I realized that a three hour cutscene per three minutes of gameplay just wasn't my thing. I initially went into Ultra Kill thinking that it was another brain melting Finnish LSD simulator, just like these guys, but it turned out to be so much more. Ultra Kill is brimming with secrets of all varieties, whether that be a fishing level, dating simulator, game breaking mechanics that are actually just regular mechanics, and the stellar storytelling. There is so much to dissect that honestly, I had to break my promise about not making long videos. What better way to begin this very fucking long journey than to go back to its genesis? Although the game has changed quite a bit, there are plenty of things that still remain to this day. The iconic title screen, along with a sample of Gustav Holt's Mars The Bringer of War, was a staple within Ultra Kill's design ever since its earliest version. You don't really hear about Mars The Bringer of War that much, despite being a backbone for so many brilliant sci-fi compositions, like the iconic Star Wars theme. The British composer Gustav Holtz finished writing Mars in early in 1914 before World War I began. But despite this, the music today is mostly viewed as the theme song for the war to end all wars, until they made a questionable sequel. And this is one of our first ever happy accidents, cause Hagida himself had no fucking idea just how ironic having this sample in the beginning of the game would be later down the line. Gore was pivotal from a very early stage in Ultra Kill's development, with shots blasting off parts of enemies and splattering that sweet, sweet tomato jam all over the wall. Little did we know, that would become the single biggest gameplay mechanic in Ultra Kill. Through devlog 4 to 10, we got to see some of the more familiar aspects of the game come into fruition, like the malicious head. We also got the iconic UI, which never went away. That's pretty nice. Also, dual wielding was a mechanic, not just a power up. Uh, I just love with the barrage of my pistols and the waves of blood cover all of my senses. There are plenty of these updates spread throughout 60 installments, so if you're interested, I'd recommend you to check them out, as the game essentially gets made in front of you. Unless you have an ADHD brain, in that case, layer one of hell for you. Humanity is dead, blood is fuel, hell is full. These three lines would essentially become the cornerstone for the whole game's mechanics, lore, and gameplay. And keep in mind, the text is red, that will come up a bit later. You are a robot, designed to live off of blood, but all of humanity has died out. So now you, along with thousands of your kind, have descended down into hell for more blood. Humanity may be dead, but hell... <laughs> hell is full. The first levels of the game are essentially the tutorials for Ultra Kill, giving you the essential weapons along with introducing you the most common enemies. The revolver is one of the most straightforward weapons in the game, until you realize that every single weapon is a bloodborne trick weapon with three varieties, one of which is you 
tossing a fucking coin in the sky, shooting it, and ricocheting the bullet into an enemy's cranium. Ah yes, I always wanted a Bloodborne trick weapon in my FPS boomer shooter. As I said, this level also introduces you to some of the most common enemies, and the first enemy you get to fight is the filth. One of the main traits is that they give excellent head. I will not be questioned, that is factual. On their own, they don't really pose that much of a threat, but during Ultra Kill's brain-melting combat, one of them can easily slip by you and uh, give you the Freddy Fazbear jump scare. Filth are the weakest enemies in the game. As explained, the terminals present at the start of each level. The terminals act as a second menu, giving you access to weapon shop, enemy information, and Gmod the Construct. What the fuck is happening? <laughs> Here you get to find out about many of the different classes of enemies, such as husks. Husks are the physical manifestation of a sinner's soul. Their physical form is based off of the value of the original soul, which is determined by the strength of their will and its prevalence in public consciousness. Basically it comes down to if rice gum thinks are irrelevant or not. Filth are the lowest ranking of husks, whose souls were too weak and unimportant to even buy the Hustlers University membership, and subsequently they never achieved the supreme gigachat body. Uh. I'll steal Pyro's bit for this video, at least as long as I will remember, and give them a shitty D tier. They, they're, just, they're just jump scaring boogers at this point. Now, as for the other one, you can't quite have an arena quake like shooter uh, thing without the common projectile enemies. We have the Stray, introduced alongside the Filths. These guys are lanky, bloody, fucking goofy ass guys who run away from you if you approach them. The only enemy that tries to escape you, by the way. They fire one projectile at a time very slowly, and since they have to hit this, they basically pose no threat. Eat here, they just run away from me, I guess. Towards the later parts of Prelude, you fight the Malicious Face, the first boss of Ultra Kill. This is probably the first proper threat you face in the game, boasting a large health pool and multiple attacks, until they become one of the most reused enemies in the game. The Malicious Face is also a brand new enemy type, a demon, notably a lesser demon. Demons are creatures born from the mass of hell. They're easily recognizable by their stone exoskeleton and slow movement. See here, they're pretty tough, but Neymar can kick him into a goalpost any day. Oh yeah, did I mention this? You can essentially parry every single attack in the game. And I mean virtually everything. Except for these guys who are pyro clones from Team Fortress 2. Just don't let pyro cynical see them. This trait of having a face-shaped exoskeleton for demons will become a very prominent aspect of this video. But before we get into that, what even is hell? In essence, hell in Ultra Kill resembles that of hell described in the Bible, with the words gnashing and wailing of teeth being ripped straight from Matthew 13. Hakita's Inspiration, however, stretches even further within Divine Comedy, better known as Dante's Inferno. A lot of people don't know this for some reason, but Divine Comedy, Dante's Inferno, is actually split across three major parts within a single book. Inferno, Purgatory, and Heaven. Within Dante's Inferno and Ultra Kill, there are in total nine layers of hell, with each layer representing a different sin. Only seven circles are playable as of now, these being Limbo, Lust, Gluttony, Greed, Wrath, Heresy, and Violence. What you're playing through right now isn't even hell proper, it's merely the mouth of hell, an introduction to the, the brain rot that's ahead. Throughout the third level of Ultra Kill, we get glimpses of Yellow Dante. I don't know why I wrote this in the script. I tried to kill him here, but it's a scripted event, so unlucky. His appearance essentially serves as a teaser for the upcoming boss fight. The Swords Machine is the final class of enemies you will encounter for quite some time, actually. Unlike everything you've encountered so far, it's actually a machine, just like you. He can be fought as a secret boss fight in the second level, and as a proper encounter in the third. Upon beating the second encounter, it drops the shotgun, which is personally my favorite weapon in the entire game. When I said you can parry everything, I mean it. Even your own attacks. With the shotgun, if you parry at the same time as you fire, you will throw out a large explosion that decimates enemies. And I used to spam this shit constantly. But then one thing pops up. If you want to P-rank these levels, you gotta use every single weapon in the game, cause that counts as style points. So, yeah, bye bye shotgun bazooka thing, I guess. Okay, so about the lore of these guys. They're essentially scrapyard monstrosities that take parts from other robots. Their legs specifically are taken from another enemy we'll encounter a bit later. These are also one of the very few enemies that still can actually speak to you, but choose not to, cause... 
I'd give them a solid beat here. They look cool, plus they gave me a nice weapon. Hippie! Ah yes, now the final enemy we encounter for this section, the Cerberus, also known as a lesser demon. Cerberus in Greek mythology is a three-headed dog that guards hell. Here though, there, he's just the Moai statue. I like how lore accurate it is in the sense that they're placed at the entrance of hell, but then they're just mewing statues instead of a three-headed dog. Within Dante's Inferno, Cerberus appears way later down the line as one of the main forms of punishment against the sinners. Hagida initially intended to have the three of these enemies jump you, similar to the three heads of Cerberus, but he thought it would have been too difficult for a little baby boy. Oh, baby man, baby man. One horrifying thing I found out about this guys is that every statue, without exception, is a proper Cerberus. Not a hollow statue or decoration, but rather proper demons. They just choose not to awaken. So keep that in mind the next time you walk past these guys. Who knows, they might be watching that robo yacht. Beat here, I got three reasons. They're perpetually mewing, striking the thinker pose, and concentrating a hell nuke in their hand. Goated. Now, we finally get into the proper layers of hell. No, sit the fuck down, viewer, because this game becomes uh, something else this? when it doesn't want to be a boomer shooter. <laughs> Explain to me what the fuck that was. Chat, nah, nah, bruh, I'm uh, nah. Throughout Ultra Kills Layers, we get access to secret levels by completing puzzles and going through obscure paths. First of these secret levels is in Prelude 2. All you gotta do is drink the Imposter Potion, then vent, grab the blue skull and place it here. Congratulations, now you get to experience horrors beyond human comprehension. You are not alone. Something dwells in these dark, dingy, dangerous halls, only referred to as something Wicked. It's unkillable and makes this sound when approaching you. Have fun. Ah! After being lost for 30 ah! minutes and shitting myself five times, I made it out. And for my troubles, I got lore. He's telling me he's not gonna jump, right? At the end of these secret areas, we get secret transmissions, or testaments, words of God, essentially. This is Testament 1, and it reads, Mankind is a failure, free will is a flaw, let the evil of their own lips consume them, then I shall begin again, with my word as law. Despite the lack of divinity, this was written by God, in the context of how his generosity, which is giving humanity free will, backfired severely. They ended up spawning abominations and creating conflicts that would bring forth infinite hyperdeath upon themselves. Maybe he feels like this because humanity is wicked. Maybe he feels like this because humanity doesn't follow his word. But despite this being God, he doesn't sound like one. He sounds like a average unity coder. God seems like a flawed entity who can't control everything and makes mistakes. And this will become a very important thing later in the video. Also, I forgot something. The fucking schisms. Uh, uh, they're just buffer versions of these guys and fire more bullets. I hate them. They also look like the Separatists from Star Wars, the Clone Wars, so uh, see it here. As we arrive at the gates of hell, there's a small text here stating, Abandon all hope, ye who enter here. These are very iconic lines from Dante's Inferno, where Dante and Virgil arrive at the gates of hell and, well, they read that. But here's the thing, there were more things written on the gates of hell. Through me you pass into the city of Woe. Through me you pass into eternal pain. Through me along the people lose for I. Justice the founder of my fabric moved. To rear me was the task of power divine, supremest wisdom, and primeval love. Before me things create were none, save things eternal, an eternal I endure. All hope abandon ye who enter here. This was most definitely another line inspired by Hakita from Dante's Inferno, and as you can tell from the scripture, it sounds like hell is speaking to any soul that enters here directly, almost as if it has consciousness. Welcome to Limbo, a very nice, natural, and calming area where you can experience all the delights of the world. The shining sun, blue skies, chirping of birds, and all that until you realize they are just screen projections and, and the chirping of birds is played on speakers behind plastic trees. This is still hell, your prison, and the structure constantly reminds you of how you could have gone outside instead of grinding CS all day. Your problem, missile alone ramp, missile alone ramp. 
Within Divine Comedy, Limbo is very much so a normal Earth-like area where you have Caesar and some other Greek individuals present. According to Dante, Limbo is very much so like Earth, but without death. Here, souls can live in an environment that is very similar to that of Earth, which is why Hakita replicates that through the design of Limbo. Limbo also has plenty of secrets, one of them being you tossing a coin to your Witcher and going into the secret level. Ugh. I will warn you though, the following sequence will make you actually use your brain, and uh, I don't know if you have any left right now. Remember when Ultra Kill used to be a shooter? Haha, <laughs> yeah, me neither. That was a lie, by the way. This is where the true gameplay loop emerges. P puzzles. 26 puzzles. <laughs> it's actually 26 puzzles. Here, the biggest boss fight is the fight against your ADHD, so good luck with that. If you do manage to actually beat every single puzzle, you get rewarded with something pretty fascinating. Testament 2. Failure after failure after failure after failure, again and again and again, you get the point. My faith begins to falter. Something is horribly going wrong, and by the sounds of things, not even God can fix this. It seems to me that he's trying to fix creation, and more specifically, humanity. Maybe he wished to make a perfect world, but he failed. Perhaps he tried to remove free will and have his word be absolute law, and uh, something went utterly wrong. After we go through a few more levels, the reason as to why God is the most sane okay, Unity game pajama. developer will become pajama very apparent. Day. As we go through Limbo, we get introduced to new mechanics. A nail gun, which is essentially your average Gatling gun with magnetic properties, and two new enemies, drones, and more interestingly, street cleaners. Terminals have this oh, to say about them. Oh, fuck. The drones are essentially mass-produced surveillance camera and security guards. Although they're originally built with non-lethal ammunition in mind, they scavenged for parts to make their efforts in getting blood far easier. They're also described as curious by nature, which is interesting, in a sense that these robots are all actually sentient. They can think, they can understand, and they vary in intelligence. So I guess that's why their honest response to getting shot is to kamikaze into you. This establishes for a second time that blood is vital for robots, and more importantly, that they were created by humans which I guess it's kind of obvious at this point. As to why blood of all things needed to become the fuel source, well, uh, let's just say you'll have to wait an hour for that answer. Every attack, and I mean everything, except for blues, and even some of them you can still parry, can be parried by punching them, with another exception being flamethrowers. The street cleaners are the only enemy types that you cannot parry no matter what you do. The data terminal states quite a few disturbing things about them. They were originally created to clean the environment, and according to the lore we'll experience a bit later, presumably, their reason for existing was to incinerate the mountains of human corpses on the battlefield. Because blood was essential for robots, they essentially needed to destroy that fuel source. After peace times, however, they were mainly used for hell expeditions, but after humanity's destruction, only thing they do is cleanse the world in the crimson. Towards the end of Limbo, the lore and story of Ultra Kill starts to expand at a rapid pace. Most notable addition are the books, first of which can be found here. There's also a headless skeleton here which you can name Hank after putting a blue skull on him. Hakita, explain the lore implications please. The mansion owner's diary delves into the writer's mind and how his faith is dwindling in this eternal torment, questioning how and why God would condemn sinners to eternal torment, begging for answers and trying to understand if this is appropriate punishment. Another notable aspect of this book is the reveal of Gabriel. The individual refers to Gabriel as a friend, but clearly he was abandoned ages ago. Gabriel is another angel of heaven, the strongest among the archangels, and now the judge of hell. Uh, he basically took the title for Minos after he used all of Hell's budget on bisexual lighting. My qu my word will not be questioned. It is fully canon, I swear. Let's talk about the hideous mass. A new boss fight. 
And a few other things actually, so I guess the epic buildup is kinda worthless. Hideous Mass is a greater demonic entity made up of large quantities of hell mass, all culminating in molding into this scorpion-like body. The stone surface is essentially impervious to physical damage, and thus you will have to attack in between its armor. Just fucking hug him with a nail gun, it's, it's really not that complicated. There is one more thing I find pretty interesting here. Hell mass directly led to the creation of another life form, powerful and dangerous life forms. So, does this mean hell itself is also alive? Maybe it's some sort of a super organism, and these things represent a fraction of its power. This would align perfectly with the inspirations from Dante's Inferno, but uh, I guess we'll find the answer somewhere here. <laughs> In the final level of Limbo, we get to fight this guy. V2. He is the better, cooler, sexier, and more advanced version of you. But also fat, I guess. He, just like other robots, is down here for the universal reason of using blood as fuel. But there is a key difference between you two. V1 and V2 were made during the end of the Great War between humans, but V2 was made towards the peace times, hence why his build focuses more on defense rather than offense. V1 sacrifices durability in exchange for instant regeneration upon absorbing blood, allowing him to progress with immense force to seemingly no end. Meanwhile, V2 sacrifices regeneration and mobility for more armor and health, aka he is fat. <laughs> This is why V1 is special, he is the only robot in the entire game that can regenerate on the fly. Unlike other robots, they were never mass produced, as they were made towards the end of the war, implying that these two are the only versions in existence. After you thoroughly obliterate V2's ass, he runs away and leaves his arm behind. I guess we're now One Punch Man. Okay, so that's that level then. Are you ready for sexy robot chicks now? This place has a lot to offer, and it is a big step from other levels, in terms of visual storytelling, pacing, and enemy introductions. Only problem is, it's fucking California. The Lust Lair is appropriately decorated with neon lighting, capturing a unique red light district aesthetic. Sadly, it isn't just homoerotic robots. In the distance, you can see a very particular thing. This is the handiwork of Gabriel, and that thing is Minos' lifeless husk. The imagery here is inspired by the movie Lighthouse, starring Willem Dafoe. You know, the, the, the guy from this meme. The movie follows these two sexually frustrated men as they are designated on an island to maintain a lighthouse. They don't know for how long... They don't know for how long they'll stay here, or how long they've already been here. Eldritch influence seemingly starts to flood their minds, and eventually, the light at the top of the lighthouse becomes the tipping point for their sanity. King Minos was a interesting individual. In life, he was a well-known, beloved ruler. We already established how a soul's will, notoriety, relevancy, and remembrance will allow them to manifest as a bigger, stronger husk. And King Minos, as a result, became one of the most powerful beings in existence, alongside Sisyphus. King Minos is a prominent character within Dante's Inferno as well, because Dante, for some reason, molded Greek mythology with Christianity. I, I don't know, bro, it's weird. King Minos transformed the previously desolate wasteland of lust into a utopia, a proper society where people could actually see some semblance of normal life. This event was appropriately called the Lust Renaissance, with virtually everything being done in service of Lust's residents. Hagida mentioned how some levels within Lust, like Sheer Heart Attack, are set in a hydroelectric plant, which fuels the sprawling metropolis beneath. In this level, we also get introduced to what is my favorite enemy in the entire game, the Mind Flayer. <laughs> Can you guess why? The Mind Flayers are another type of robots, but there's a catch to them. They actually look smashable. The female traits you see are features the robot hand-picked. The actual automaton itself is only the half part. The rest is viewed as useless plastic. But for some reason, these robots, who are meant to be very efficient in everything they do, became very attached to that body. To such an extent that if it's damaged too much, they will kaboom. Oh, my waifu's gone. Their main forms of attack are slow projectiles and hell blasts. They're harder to parry, but easier to dodge. The best way to deal with them is to get very, very, very close and finish as fast as possible. I mean that in every single context you can possibly imagine. S tier enemy, we need more smashable enemies for the five non-gay ultra kill fans. We also get to see another enemy type here, the, the fucking soldier. They're just beefier, smarter version of strays. I hate them. They're annoying. C tier. 
Get out of my face. Speaking of the thick green yacht, the glory of this layer doesn't end here. Because you can get the BFG 9000, which is cool and all. But this is where proper ultra kill content starts. Ultra kill is many things. A boomer shooter, a migraine, Dante's Inferno, but with robots. But it's also a dating sim. After breaking all three switches within sheer heart attack, you can go through this waterfall. And well, the following sequence is the best thing I've ever seen. Welcome to Oyasumi V1 V1, the best thing humanity ever made. This is your typical visual novel with V1, <coughs> I mean, marriage as a possible love interest. Why the fuck does this robot look so sexy? Unfortunately, she is not smashable, so lower that railgun of yours. The conversation quickly goes from Daisuke. Sorry, but the following clip contained Leo speaking Japanese, so I had to stop him before everyone watching clicked off. He made this segment cues he is lonely and gets no bitches, but he also wants to get some funnies for the video. What he was trying to say was everything was cute on this makeshift yandere simulator until I made it too deep. I drilled into this guy's skull instead of the other way around. Sorry, I'm just depressed like that. Cope. Anyway, like and subscribe so the homeless Georgian boy doesn't commit infinite Oyasumi. I'm going to buy the body pillow right now. And with that, we've come to the final level of lust. Oh boy, this is quite something. According to Hakita's livestream, the real challenge of this level is making the fucking train tracks. Peter the head programmer had so much issues with this apparently, but the funniest part is how no one fucking uses it. We all just bunny hop our way to the boss, so he just coded this for no reason. Just don't, just don't tell him that. At the end of this train ride, we come face to face with Minos. Or well, what's left of him anyway. Minos was killed by Gabriel, and as a result, he stole the title of the Judge of Hell, leaving Minos as a empty husk, controlled by these worm creature thingies. The original host of the body is now gone, and these things were the ones controlling him. The worm creature things were also intended to become a regular enemy type, but that was scrapped. Now, you might be asking, what happens when a soul within hell dies? If you're an ultra giga chad, you get the gojo treatment. Now we can continue on to gluttony, which we enter through his mouth. I guess. From Hakita's video, I discerned that not even Hakita knows how Hell Trevor works. It's very individualistic almost. It isn't a pathway that makes sense, as in if someone has a hard enough will and power to descend, they will eventually come across some sort of a path that will lead them down into the depths of Hell, even if it makes no physical sense. I suppose that's why so many robots are descending into Hell at such a rapid pace. Their insatiable hunger for blood compels them to keep on marching, essentially, forever. Within Dante's Inferno, it is also very much so up in the air as to how hell travel works. Dante just collapses and loses consciousness and then voila, he's in the next layer. Gluttony doesn't really hold that much lore-related secrets, except for except for two fights, which are also the second and third hardest boss fights in the entire game. You can only access one of them if you're a normie, but if you hate yourself, well, get ready to put everything you love on the side and the P-rank every single mission. Up until this point, you probably saw how you finish a level with a rank, and that isn't there just to boost your ego. It holds story significance. If you manage the P rank in every Act 1 level, by obtaining S in all three categories, you can fight a secret boss. One of the two prime souls in Ultra Kill. The Gojo Prison Box. Ah, uh, my, my bad, my bad. I mean Gojo himself. Minos Prime. Minos' soul manifested as an entity that goes far beyond nearly any other creature within existence. Not even the cocky angels can fight prime souls and live to tell the tale. That's why they fucking put him in a pr flesh prison thing. Hagida confirmed that it would take an army of angels just to kill a single one. So, yeah. We described Minos to be a very nice, gentle, and progressive individual. So, how does he feel about us freeing him? Fuck you, fuck you, Minos. Worst fucking piece of shit boss I ever had with this in my life. Salvation. 
from this cold. <laughs> Minos is a judge of hell, and he's a righteous judge at that. Minos knows the crimes you and your kind committed, and not just the residents of hell, but also on whole of humanity. He knows the rivers of blood you've drank. He knows the mountain of corpses you've erected. And as a result, he casts a death sentence. <laughs> Minos is an incredibly hard boss fight, which made me want to lose my fucking sanity. I wish I knew this sooner, because if I just stuck to the ground and dodged him like a common Dark Souls 3 enemy, I would've actually beaten him very soon. But I decided to take the fight in the air, where my ass got obliterated. Staying in the air is a fucking death sentence with this guy. Oh yeah, by the way, don't forget, he's not only the second hardest boss in the game, but also the third strongest boss is literally on the other room. Before we get into that, the following terminal is kinda interesting in a sense that it actually depicts humanity's endeavors to make hell more interconnected by not only sending out different sources of information, rather that be physical matter or sounds through these terminals. One of the first successful variants of this transmission was Russ Morgan uh, 78 RPM vinyl of Are You Foolin'? Which is quite something. I guess that's why we hear this music at the beginning of the menu screen. Now, the Gabriel boss fight. Gabriel has slain many, many bloodthirsty robots like you, who wish to ravage hell with their insatiable hunger. He gives you an ultimatum. Turn back or die. Naturally, you being V fucking one, you ignore him and decide to punch back Gabriel's already faded hairline. Gabriel is a very interesting character. On one hand, he is an angel, but acts nothing like one. He is brutal, wrathful, and curses at you. He is so cocky and arrogant that he doesn't even see fit to use his real weapons against you. Thus, he creates light constructs. Because for angels, being beaten by humans is an absurd concept. Only things they fear are prime souls, so being bested by a machine of war was just unimaginable. After beating him, he realizes that Sigma is the only way to life as he returns to heaven. With that, Act 1 comes to a close. But there's still one more thing we gotta look over. Glimpses of Heaven. As we mentioned, it is unheard of for an angel to lose against a human, let alone a human creation. This is so insane in fact that the Council of Heaven believes that Gabriel was trolling and accuses him of treason. Nevertheless though, he lost, and rather than the Council believes that is completely irrelevant. As punishment, he is stripped away from the holy light of God, as Gabriel now has 24 hours to hunt you down and finish what you started. The pain Gabriel feels is rivaled by tortures used in hell itself. There is no divinity in this, no reason, only pride, hatred and punishment. Everything is twisted. The reason for why heaven's like this is because God left it, and as a result, an authoritarian hive mind of counselors remained to oversee a hollow sanctuary. Over the course of time, they forgot what word of God was and disintegrated, morally and spiritually. So, what will become of the new Apostle of Hate? Ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the Greed Lair, also known as Egypt. Ah yes, my favorite part of history, the dual I occupation like of Egypt. Them. You can find everything here. The scorching sand, the pyramids, and even Dio. There's a reason as to why the Eiffel Tower and the Big Ben are inside this level. That's because greed represents more than just money. It holds and contains everything that could represent humanity's hubris, whether that be money, structures of power, or even him. Act 2 is a point where any and all respect Hakita had for your time goes out the window because every single level is drastically longer. My prospects of P-ranking these is going through the floor now. You are a worthless bitch ass nigga. Before we get into that however, we gotta meet a new enemy type. Something that really upsets the entire structure of Ultra Kill's combat. And that is a proper angel enemy. 
The virtue, inspired by the biblically accurate depiction of the angels, you know, the guys who say, do not be afraid and look at you like this, is the only angel outside of Gabriel present in the whole game. Unlike other enemies that need to actually see you to shoot you, the virtues can snipe you from literally any position through any obstacle. Very fun. They will mark you with a circle, and once that happens, a ray of light will make you rethink your atheism. In the terminals, these things are referred to as lesser angels, and even compared to husks. If you ask me, there's no comparison. Husks, at the very least, give you good head. Similar to husks, lesser angels are formed from human souls, with their notoriety and will defining their powers. But in this case, the soul's virtuousness also comes into play. Their abstract shape is associated to them not being uh, that dedicated to God. Thus, they have a lower class in heaven. Classism in heaven, wow, okay, you cool. Because virtues are deemed as quite puny, they're tasked with being wardens of hell. Other angels felt too cocky, so they didn't want to do it. Although this brings an interesting question. Up until this point, we've never got to encounter any angel outside of Gabriel. No greater angels, no supreme angels. But why is that exactly? After God left, heaven went into turmoil. Heaven, without a supreme ruler, could have easily turned into another hell. So to keep this from happening, most angels returned to heaven to restore order. This is why we only got to see angels after Act 1. But here comes another question. Why would God possibly leave? His absence caused so much destruction. Why would he run away from his own creation? Well, uh, let's just say you've been looking at the answer this whole time. To properly understand, look no further than the bane of my existence, 4S. Secrets in Act 2 are far more hidden and complex, until they're not for some reason. In Area 2 of Creed, you gotta hit this button, go down here, grab this thing and take it up here, and voila, the sun is no more. Now, if you turn around, you'll see a miniature sun behind your spawn point. Yes, a miniature sun. D do not ask what the corpse is, uh, I don't know, I, I just don't know, and I, and I do not care to know, cause what's about to come will make you want to commit self-oof. Ladies and gentlemen, I welcome you to the Clash of the Bandicoot, a Crash Bandicoot fan game inside Ultra Kill, where the Bandicoot is V1. <laughs> I play Dark Souls 1 Prepare to Die Edition on 30 FPS on a stuttering, shitty laptop. Then I moved on to Dark Souls 2 and 3, and so and Soul Level 1 ran both of them. I do not mean this as a flex. Rather, the shit I experienced on this level drove me more insane than any other game could ever possibly imagine. Jesus Christ, I'm gonna fucking die. Parry those. Oh my day. God. Jesus, I didn't see anything. Oh, bro. I can't make it. Oh my, I'm dead. Oh my god! <laughs> what nah. This secret was intentionally designed by Hagida to be as brutal as the original Crash Bandicoot games. Oh yeah, by the way, if you break every single box, you will be given a new game mode, which allows you to play through the entire game in the Crash Bandicoot mode. I'd rather actually hang my- Well, uh, at least the terminal at the end was quite rewarding. Let's just say it offsets the entire story of Ultra Kill. Testament 3. Uncountable cycles of creation wasted. Uncountable formulas from mine without free will wasted. Damn this man for failing to follow my rule, my word, my law. Damn to an eternity of torture and suffering. The wailing and gnashing of teeth. For I have created hell, and I can no longer unmake it. I think up until this point, we've already established that God is not as godly as he may seem. He makes mistakes, he feels guilt, he feels frustration, and he can't make things work the way he wants them to work. And this is the biggest example of that. God tried his best to remove free will from humanity, but ultimately, he wasn't able to. Thus, he resorted to far more barbaric means. He created hell to strike fear into their hearts and keep them in line. But things only got worse from here. Hell is alive. Moreover, it's like God. Hell actively creates life forms from its own mass, essentially making new life forms that can think and act in certain ways. Hell isn't just in likeness of God but it might even surpass him. Hell's power scared God so much, he deemed it necessary to run away from everything. 
My guy clocked out as if it was a 9 to 5 job and left this cosmic fucking abomination to fester. And wouldn't you know, a few centuries later, things would get way, way worse. But before we get into that in like half an hour, let's look over what kind of an effect God's departure had on all of existence, such as in Hell. A lot of angels descended into Hell to be wardens, to see if souls are actually torturing themselves. But then, when God left, a lot of them had to leave Hell, and thus, the husks revolted. Two figures come up when we discuss Hell's revolutions, one of them being King Minos, who opted for a peaceful resolution, whilst King Sisyphus He's a fucking megalomaniac. He was planning a coup d'etat for many, many eons now. And finally, the time has come where every single husk deems it necessary to fight back. Thus, King Sisyphus created the Sisyphian army and prepared for war. Many people believed that they would win, but uh, they did not know what type of suffering they would be subject to. Gabriel and the forces of heaven were able to best the insurrectionists, killing Minos and imprisoning his soul in a flesh prison, whilst a similar fate fell upon Sisyphus. I just love how this robot going beep boop beep boop bah, it turned into such a in-depth, well-drawn out and detailed story, it's so good. We will talk about Sisyphus in like, maybe like 10 minutes, but for now, grab two additional hands, actually make it three, M no, maybe six is best, yeah, something like that, and proceed to the boss of level two, the Sisyphian Insurrectionist. The Supreme Husk, as the name implies, used to be an elite soldier within the Sisyphean army. Upon their defeat, however, members of heaven decided it was necessary to carve them apart bit by bit and leaving only enough material for them to actually carry out their own penance. So why doesn't he have a head? I don't fucking know, ask Gabriel. Also, you can find a random stalker here, uh, for some reason I don't mention these guys in the video, but he's just baby, do not disturb. I think you get why these guys have a boulder attached to their arm. I just killed a mosquito, literally out of the sky, called me fucking one punch man. After going through the pyramids like Indiana Jones searching for Dio, we get a fated rematch with V2. Also there's this uh, mysterious druid boss fight, uh, another brain rot joke by Hakita, uh, no lore implications I promise. Let's go back to the best fanboy V2. He is back, stronger, faster, smarter, and a lot angrier. If you punch him with his own arm, he gets hella pissed and I love it. This whole time V2 was observing you, trying to improve himself day by day. Armed with not only schizophrenia, but also a green arm. He is better now and he is ready to rum... Yeah. Rumble more like a fucking tumble to his death. Unlucky. A lot of people still believe that he's alive, but then Hakita said this. This character is so fucking dead. It's it, like it's so dead as it possibly could ever be. And people are still like, maybe it's alive though. Maybe it comes back. Maybe someone like reconstructs it. Like, reconstructs what? There's nothing left. Bro turned into both your god for a sec, I love it. I guess you have seven arms now? I, I don't know. Welcome to England. We got everything here, such as the very nice British weather, the overtly Catholic church hating Anglo-Saxons, and the occasional Scottish man. Wrath is an interesting glare in the sense that it is one of the very few levels that actively documents its own history and serves as a gateway to Ultra Kill's insane fucking movement. This level has three main secrets, so let's go from least cancerous to the most brain rot. Firstly, uh, if you literally skip across the water like a rock, yes, that is a mechanic, you'll discover another reference to the Lighthouse movie. Yeah, remember Willem it's Dafoe? So <laughs> now as for the second brain rot, to begin this section, you need two things. Firstly, for your own mental sake, grab the rocket launcher. Trust me, you'll need it. The rocket launcher allows you to shoot time-stopping rockets, which you can jump on top of, and then steer the rockets into heaven. I'm not even joking, this is a proper mechanic! Next thing you gotta do is go on top of the Titanic and grab the hamster. You'll need it for sacrifice. Now, you're armed with the hamster and the rocket launcher, thus you're worthy to climb Drake's dick. After many efforts, if you actually manage to get up here, you will discover the true god of this world. Jakida is ready to take in the sacrifice of the hamster, and he will decimate the world. He'll make it white, and then paint a new world upon the pure canvas. <laughs> Congratulations, you've crashed your game. Unlucky. Now, as for the proper brain rot, 
Oh boy. 5S is actually very easy to find. All you gotta do is go here, shoot this vent, climb in and voila. I welcome you to the fishing level. <laughs> <laughs> the worst part about this is how it's actually really detailed and has a bunch of secrets in it. Here you can do many things, one of those things being uh, fishing. You can capture a multitude of fish, like the stupid fish, then the peter fish, and if you go all the way up the list, you'll catch the frog from Iron Lung. Bruh. Aside from some references to other games, there aren't any insane lore implications, except for size 2 fish. Many men in the past have been obsessed with capturing the size to fish, the legendary Magikarp deemed to be a myth, yet many humans in the past and present yearn to capture the size to fish, for every other fish is merely size 1. Many fishermen, many anime dweebs, many robot enthusiasts have been searching for this, and despite the words of Hakita, none of us believe size 2 fish is actually real, we're all delusional. Hakita got so annoyed seemingly because no one can discover where the size 2 fish is, but then in the patch notes you can see how the size 2 fish is catchable. I don't get it. Is it real? Is it not? Am I losing my mind? <laughs> Now, before we move on to Nevada, we have England to properly look over. In this level, thanks to one of my viewers, I uncovered a secret. I realized that movement in this game is fucking insane. Aside from running, jumping, dashing, smashing, sliding, and committing multitude of felonies, you can essentially break the game. If you jump and slam against the wall at the same time, you develop these yellow lines around you. And if you dash or jump at the right time upon landing, you will reach heaven. Some would call it heaven appears her <laughs> well there goes half of my viewers i guess if breaking the universal speed limit isn't enough for you you can combine your weapons and fly higher yes i did not mention this it has something to do with you charging your shotgun firing a real grenade and then shooting it with the railgun this takes away half of your hp but you travel at light speed the wrath layer story wise marks a turning point in many ways rather that be meta storytelling that explains absolute bullshit and all the way down to historical recounts of the final war before we get into the ferryman let's discuss the meta storytelling here. In this level we also get introduced to the sentries and the terminal has quite a few interesting things to say about these guys. First and foremost, these guys were the only robots that could not be repurposed after the final war. Their parts, their mechanics and their designation was so combat focused they could not find any other purpose for them. If anything, other robots are literally going after their yacht, like it's insatiable. The chainsaw man guys literally have their legs attached to them. But the reason why I mention these guys is because they are the only robots that can actually see the world as it properly is. Most other robots, including V1, see the world in a far more simplified manner to conserve energy. What they see is actually rendered in a low polygon version. But the sentries need every bit of information that could possibly be obtained because they are snipers. So this gives us a lore-friendly reason as to why the game has a PS1 graphic aesthetic! Yeah! <laughs> I, th I think I'm big brain because not even Hakita mentioned this. I don't think he even mentioned this. <laughs> I gotcha, finally. Something original in the video. In this level, we get way more information about humanity's final war. Humanity for many, many years has been at war with many different models of robots being created virtually every few years. First iterations of these robots were bulky and rigid, and over time, as technology progressed, they became slimmer, more powerful and enticing. Some, on the other hand, were able to end humanity itself, but the war ended with humanity surviving. Which begs the question, is the first three lines of the game a lie? Humanity is dead, blood is fuel, hell is full. I don't quite know. After all the information we went through, it is easy to imagine that humanity survived. Hell, we even get descriptions about how, during peace times, humanity strived to reach greater horizons by exploring hell itself. So this begs the question, if a calamity like the final war didn't end humanity, what did? The water you see here is actually not water. The Ocean of Sticks used to be a mighty river where the ferrymen would pick up souls to transport them. Hakita here takes inspiration from Greek mythology, where specific entities would travel across lakes to transport souls. Now we've arrived to my favorite subject, 
Genesis. The Ferryman's Diary is a very interesting piece of writing, which describes the times of war when millions every single minute used to arrive in wrath. Millions of these weeping souls were almost too much for the dedicated religious ferryman to handle. But then, some calamity struck the mortal world. One day, the current shifted. Wave after wave, for minutes on end, millions, billions rushed through, as though the throat of the world was cut wide and the head wrenched back to speed the poor. With billions of souls every minute rushing down, it flooded the world, transforming a once great river of souls into an ocean. Humanity was on a fast track of destroying itself with the escalating war, but in the end, despite everyone losing, humanity still survived. So this begs the question, if a calamity like this, whatever it was, could not wipe out humanity, what could? I'm sorry for blueballing you cause you will not get the answer of this information for a little bit. But right now I need to edge you the same way Megumi does to Mahorata. Oh yeah, by the way, did you know the ferrymen are actually pretty cool? Yeah, you can just give them a coin and pass through the next level. You don't need to fight them. You do not need to fight them. Also, Gabriel was really chill with them. Yeah, Gabriel cool like that. Oh yeah, by the way, uh, I, I think I found the <laughs> size to... <laughs> yes, guys, I did it, I did it, I did it. I found the legendary magic carp. <laughs> don't worry, guys, follow me. The fish does not bite. If it does bite you, however, don't worry. Just like every other enemy in the game, you can bully its entire existence. The Leviathan is a very interesting entity, both in Dante's Inferno, the Bible, and in Ultra Kill. Within Ultra Kill, it is classified to be a supreme demon. But if we look at the lore behind this thing, it is not quite that. Essentially, it is an amalgamation of all these British citizens that uh, got tired of swimming, sank at the bottom of the ocean, and then got combined into this thing. Which is interesting, because this thing is called a supreme demon, but it sounds more like a husk. Similar to the clone drones we talked about before, they're also an amalgamation of two souls combining and then forming this body instead of something else. The protagonist of the original, very popular Nokia game Snake is also within Dante's Inferno, but this time he is one of the seven princes of hell alongside Lucifer, Beelzebub, Mammoth, and a few others I cannot remember. Within the Bible, the Leviathan is prophesied to be present at the end of the world, and that makes me want to ask a question about its existence, specifically about Dante's Inferno. Does this mean that we will potentially get other demons within Ultra Kill? Other greater demons that were formerly angels? In Ultra Kill, we already got a name drop for Lucifer, we just didn't talk about it because honestly I forgot how I structured this video. But Gabriel also name dropped the devil, which is of course Lucifer. This could mean that we might get some information and even encounters with the other princes of hell the further down into hell we go. My hopes of this happening goes back to the... to the fishing level. Yeah, this cancer doesn't end yet. If you gather every single unique fish, the garage door will open, and let's just say the terminal is quite something. Father, why eternal torment? Is torture unending truly a fate fit for a fool? An angel so bright and beautiful asked me this, and I could find no answer, for I could never face the guilt of what I've done, my regret, a gnawing cancer. In my hour of weakness, terror possessed me, and then I cast Lucifer too into the infernal den. Once I realized what I had done, I could only weep as I sank slowly into the depths of despair. Deep. Oh, so deep. This is God making yet another mistake. As we discussed, God in Ultra Kill is far less divine than we could possibly imagine. He makes mistakes, he's susceptible to emotions, and subsequently and unfortunately acts upon them. This is the first time we get a name drop for Lucifer, and what's interesting is that within Ultra Kill, he seems to have empathy, love, and even respect to everything around him, including humans. But the main reason why I wanted to talk about the terminal is because of this line. I cast Lucifer too into the infernal den. That wordage could imply that God was talking about humans, and how he cast Lucifer as well, along with humans, into hell. However, this could also imply that God cast down other angels into hell, forming the foundations for the seven princes of hell. So maybe, just maybe, we might get at least Lucifer at the center of the pride layer, and maybe the other princes of hell. That should be so hype.
I know we kinda joked about God being the least mentally ill Unity developer, but I do feel like God never really felt happy with punishing people. But maybe he felt it necessary in his hour of wrath and pride because he knew what humanity was capable of. And to steer them in a better direction, he chose the honestly not the best path. But I do feel like this is the reason why God left. He tried to fix something over and over and over, but his initial creations of everything failed him again and again. He created humanity to follow him, but humanity refused. He created hell to punish them. He regretted it, but then he couldn't fix it. He saw how angels worried about him and humans at the same time, and then he refused to listen to his creations and condemned them to suffering. Everything he touched was flawed, and everything he tried to fix became even more flawed. And this might have been the main reason why he decided to fucking clock out of his job, get your bitch ass back here and clean up this mess. This is just the ramblings of a very mentally insane Georgian boy because I've been working on this video for a long time now. Okay, so Mirage here. That line Leo says about God trying to fix things only to make shit worse is confirmed by the game. Leo, as electric as he is, predicted it clearly, and evidence of the reason why God left can be found in Violence Secret Level. I always wanted Ultra Kill to be a power wash simulator. I want to die. Fun fact about Dante's Inferno, at the center of hell, within the pride layer, Lucifer is present, chewing, for eternity, Judas. Nice! Ladies and gentlemen, I welcome you to the Heresy Lair, also known as Nevada. I think that's a good description. You have everything here, a desolate wasteland, an oppressive atmosphere, very dry and hot climate, and best of all, heathens everywhere! This is probably the only layer of hell that actually looks like hell. Hakita gave us a lore-friendly reason as to why this is the case, and apparently the reason why satanic symbolism is present within this level is because humanity actively chose to embrace these symbols instead of God. And now this is God's way of making fun of them, going... Unfortunately for me, however, this is also another level that houses two boss fights. The Sigma Alpha Male is one of them, but then you have the Prime Soul Sisyphus. I'm gonna come clean. I did not beat Sisyphus Prime, nor have I P-ranked every single level in Act 2, and I probably never will. You are worthless, bitch ass. Yes, you should love yourself now. A king of hell, just like Minos, but unlike him, he is barbaric with his prowess for combat and willingness to spill blood being literally etched onto his body. His new body has fists covered in blood to signify his violent nature. He is by far more powerful than Minos, perhaps the third strongest entity in all of existence. Heaven made a very special prison box just for him, but then V1 decided to tickle it and he escaped with zero trouble. Yeah, this fight is gonna be a pain in my ass. From the stories I've heard, the boss fight is actually a fucking nightmare. It is very difficult. We already discussed a lot of things about Sisyphus, but there is one more notable thing about him. Ah, uh, Sisyphus does not have a head. Yeah, it's just a glowing orb with like a flat texture of a mustache and an outline of his eyes. That's because Gabriel decapitated him, and that is literally imprinted onto his prime soul. So you're essentially fighting the least toxic blasphemous villain. I think Sisyphus is perhaps the only named and mentioned character we've seen in Ultra Kill that honestly deserves to be in hell. Because not only is his violent nature literally imprinted on his arms, but also his selfishness and pride got millions of people even worse off than without fighting. Sisyphus very much so knew that this was a losing battle. Heaven could not be beaten by any force within hell unless it was a combination of prime souls, but Sisyphus and Minos were not prime souls, so he essentially fought a losing battle and condemned millions to this fate. Despite this, however, despite Sisyphus knowing that this was a losing battle, every single fist he threw was filled with determination and love for fighting. He knew that he would lose ultimately, but knowing that he spit in the face of authority made him ultra hard. One in such situation must imagine Sisyphus happy. I said the thing. I said the thing! Once you defeat Sisyphus, we get information about things that I genuinely did not see coming. This is an ARG. 
we finally ascended to fucking brain rot to brain aneurysm. Why is my boomer shooter a fucking ARG? I really thought that my bitch ass would decode this by throwing it into ChatGPT, and let's just say the results were fucking abysmal. Let me give you some context first. Hakida threw this ARG together, which is made up of 1400 individual characters, and it was supposed to form a four word sentence. He was fucking lying about that, by the way. The final decoded sequence spelled an entire paragraph to say the least, but uh, I decided to take up this endeavor myself first. I threw into ChatGPT like a few dozen times now, and uh, I got very different answers, if you can even call it that. Firstly, one of them was the following. You will find what you are looking for in the abandoned building at the end of the street. Come alone. I don't know why ChatGPT is blackmailing me, but this is genuinely disturbing, even for Ultra Kills level. Another thing it spit in my face was, congratulations, you have decoded it, which is very much so something Hagita would do just to fuck with his fanbase. But then... Editing Leo here, so whilst I was making this video I've come to a realization that I was yapping for 5 minutes straight on basically nothing, because ChatGPT sent me some stuff and it was honestly complete bullshit, so I'm gonna cut it out because, you know, it's false info. So yeah, here is what I actually gathered from researching with reddits and other degenerate places. I figured it out. I know why creatures are suddenly and undetectably appearing inside our facilities. I know why spare parts and pieces of machines keep disappearing. I know why doors seem to malfunction and suddenly lock themselves. It's not a glitch in the system. It's hell is alive. It breathes. It thinks. The entire area is a massive, intelligent superorganism. And it is harsh and it is cruel. Just by watching us, it has learned how our systems and machines work. It has not only began to deconstruct our technology, but also reassemble it in perverse ways. Attaching parts to machines it tortures, making them into an aimless army of death and destruction. It warps them across itself and gets them past our security. It locks our doors and traps us with them. This is not an attack. This is not a defense. This is entertainment. This is an exhibition of death and cruelty and suffering for its own sake. It had grown tired of what it was, and we unwillingly just offered ourselves as new playthings. Tom, for the life of God, cancel this project immediately. We have to abandon everything and seal this place away. Leave the machines and tools behind. Evacuate as many as you can before it's too late. I can only hope that this encrypted message is received before the organism learns to read it and encrypt it. Whatever happens, we cannot let this being find a way out and spread to the surface. We have Another dies, bring me more. I hunger. Well, uh, I hope you're happy with yourself, because this answers quite a few things. Basically, in the entire gameplay loop of Ultra Kill and why this shit is happening. And this might answer exactly what happened to humanity. If the opening text is to be believed, humanity really did die. And the one responsible is hell. Hell started to corrupt everything mankind made and I would assume it first started with the terminals. These terminals spread throughout the entire game were made by humanity specifically to transfer information and even physical matter. One of the first successful methods of transporting information was a vinyl. Over time, however, hell started to corrupt these things, and these machines started to become obsessed with the emotion of boredom. So you may be asking me right now, who cares about the terminals? I only just use them and never think about them. Well, let me tell you. Have you ever thought of why you have a scoring system at the end of every single game? Well, that's because of these twisted things right here. These guys essentially allow you to get a lot of style points and record it. And once you get a lot of style points, you can exchange that for weapons. That's when the currency and point system come into play. So essentially, you download everything you do and then use that shit in the fucking terminals. They even got them so bad that they resorted to actually using a cyber realm thing where you can fight in endless mode. <laughs> and best of all, they even gave you Gmod construct so that you could fulfill all of your fantasies. <laughs> the meta writing is fucking insane. I will expand upon that a bit later. But first we gotta go back to Nevada. And let's just say... The, the Sigma male is not happy. Down until the very spots cry for mercy. My hands shall relish, ending you here and now. 
Gabriel is back. But this time, he is not a whimpering little baby boy. This time, he is Ultra Sigma. He starts off his boss fight in his enraged form. Whilst well, last time he wasn't even taking you seriously, now he is very, very mad. So anyway, you quite literally beat the Sigma out of him. In the first half of the boss fight, he is enraged. But then after you punch him a few times, he basically calms down slowly. Until ultimately he realizes that he always had. He no longer has to put up with heaven's dictatorial standards, their absurd laws, absurd treatment. He realizes that heaven is corrupted. Despite this, he also comes to terms with the fact that he himself is very much so at fault. God left many, many years ago, and over the time not only did God's fire start to whimper, but at the same time, God's word, his law, his truth started to decay. As Gabriel realized this, he comes to terms with his own mistakes, and realizes that he can change it. After this motherfucker literally strikes the throughout heaven and earth, I alone in the honored one pose, he decides to go back to heaven, and let's just say... UNLUCKY! Act 2 ends with a section where Gabriel is just being chilling in a forest as the moon behind him looms over ominously. But jokes on you, that is not the moon, that is actually... Uh, that's actually Earth. Yeah, the final war did not do it any favors, that's for sure. Gabriel starts to contemplate a lot of things after deciding to strike the Miyamoto Musashi prayer pose and become Neil Armstrong for a little bit. The reason why Gabriel is just being chilling on the moon is because within Divine Comedy, heaven is split between seven sections, with most of those sections being our solar system planets. Thank you, Windigun, for giving me this information. Bless your soul. This defeat changes Gabriel. It changes his outlook on all of creation. What he believed to be a will of God was nothing but a lie. In a shattered world, he was left to pick up the pieces. But he never realized that the pieces were never mendable. God disappeared many, many years ago, and the council of the people wishing to execute God's will started to forget and to twist what God's will truly was. Now the fire of God is dying. Heaven tried his best to strengthen the flame by giving it more and more blood, but ultimately, it didn't work. Gabriel looked upon the embers with a perfect clarity. He drew his blade and held it in the contrast to the dying flame. In the reflection, he saw a weapon reborn, no longer wielded by the will of another, but his own. He knew words no longer meant anything to the council, and thus he decided to do something drastic. Gabriel in heaven killed every single council member, drenching himself and his blade in blood. In their last moments, the council members flaunted their status, but Gabriel knows that every species, no matter how vast in rank, all bleed the same blood. And with the parting words, he decides to look upon the crowd of God's people with the decapitated head of the council member. He only has a few hours to live now, but he will use every single moment of that time to hunt you down and finish what you started. Phenomenal background image, by the way. He yoink! Violence. Before we begin, I just want to say one thing. These levels are now tremendously difficult. If you play Ultra Kill on violence difficulty, you will have a decent time trying to P rank every single level. The first act is decently easy, the second act gets harder, but the third act, may God help you, because these levels are so fucking long now. And on top of that, Haki that thought it was a brilliant idea to make a mini boss. Two of them be a regular enemy scattered throughout the level. Please do not donate to me Dark Souls and Elden Ring. I really do not want to P rank these. The second thing I want to mention is that you might be surprised right now because everything I've described is a far cry from what you see right now. This is indeed violence. Violence on your fucking eyes, that is. The reason as to why violence looks very calm, relaxing, and tranquil is not because it wishes to show you violence or inflict violence upon you, but rather its white, desolate, hollow atmosphere serves as a contrast to the blood you spill. Every single bullet you fire serves as a paintbrush that paints the world red, and the white marble serves to highlight your violence. Right off the bat, there is one very unique thing present within this level, and that is its heavenly atmosphere. It is decorated with, 
Way, way too many crosses. Up until this point in Ultra Kill, we didn't really get that many depictions of crosses. That's because Hakita himself never intended to have Ultra Kill's lore be that connected with Christianity. But the thing is, he did not realize that he had a cross on Gabriel's forehead this whole time, so he physically had to incorporate it into the story now. But the way he did it was very interesting, in the sense that he incorporated the cross not as a symbol upon which Jesus was crucified, but rather a simplified version of the Tree of Life. The significance of this tree is quite massive, as God planted it at the beginning of creation so that he could create every living creature in existence. Its nectar, which is blood, essentially serves as the fuel that gives life to everything. This ties back to what Gabriel said at the end of Act 2, about how everyone bleeds the same blood. Just like many other things in Ultra Kill, Hakida takes the Tree of Life directly from the Bible. Within the Garden of Eden, aside from the Tree of Knowledge, there was another tree, the Tree of Life. As the name obviously suggests, if Adam and Eve consumed the tree, they would have become immortal. Violence is one of the very few layers that actually has a well thought out, documented history behind it. As we all know, a lot of angels after God's departure decided to go back to heaven, and subsequently, a lot of husks decided to leave their violence lair. As the husks traversed the violent slayer, they ultimately came across this labyrinth. And let's just say, things did not go well for them. Do you see these uh, Jojo character looking ass motherfuckers? Who are actually very smashable now that I think about it. Hmm. After traversing the violent slayer, they ultimately came across this labyrinth. And let's just say... It turned out to be the most overpowered stand ability you could possibly imagine. The labyrinth plays tricks on you. It is a labyrinth after all, and subsequently, the husks got lost. Slowly but surely, they started to lose their minds, and ultimately, they lost their bodies. The labyrinth reconstructed them, ripped them apart bit by bit, and stuffed them inside these statues. If you approach them, you could even hear them breathing. This is a live recording of Hakita inhaling crack and cocaine at the same time so that he can finally wake the next few levels of Ultra Gill. Aside from these guys being similar to the Jar enemies from Elden Ring, they are also very fucking based. They are perpetually striking the Jojo pose. So fuck yeah, they are smashable any day of the week. There's also a secret to boss fight in this game, he's called the Johninator or whatever, I'm too lazy to google, but he's irrelevant to the story. You gotta do some blue skull shenanigans to fight him. So, yeah. Anyway, look! It's a cow! Because this thing decided to jump scare me and literally scare the shit out of me in my first playthrough, I decided to cheese the ever-living fuck out of him. What you can do is essentially brute force this boss fight by riding him. Right now the game doesn't have any animations to knock you off of his back, so drill a nice hole through his cranium. The Not Minotaur has a very interesting story, in the sense that it wasn't just created by hell, but rather a certain unnamed sculptor. Moreover, he gives Gifted this thing specifically to Minos. Minos saw how chaotic Godric the Crafted was, so he saw it as a representative of everything wrong he did in his past, and thus he cast it down into the labyrinth of the seventh layer. Now the Minotaur is condemned to wander aimlessly, searching for an escape that frankly doesn't exist, and only hoping to see the sky one last time. I basically cut out an entire 5 minute sequence of me yapping about this guy. We have no fucking idea who the sculptor is, okay? Maybe Hakita doesn't even know himself. Who the fuck knows? I'm losing my fucking mind right now, cause the next level of this game is Eastern Europe in 1991. Ah yes, the proper violence layer. So far we're exploring a small fraction of this level, because the labyrinth apparently is located on the very edge of the violence layer. Not only did I not get along with this level because of its very traumatic historical reminders, but also because I thought at the exit of the labyrinth there was a secret. If you look up you'll see a very glitchy texture that is specifically shaped like a door, so my bitch ass thought this was actually a proper secret, so I spent the following 30 minutes trying to get Get up to it, and once I did, it just turned out to be a broken texture. Hakita, I hate you.
This layer is quite interesting as it basically tells us the history of humans. In the distance we can see a war raging on, massive towering robots shooting hails of bullets at each other. That depicts the final war's climactic moments. Humanity at this point is on its last legs, and the area around here reflects that, with even the levels having animated set pieces that get destroyed. The clock tower was actually a reference to an artist on Twitter who just draws clocks, and at the top of it there's like a sleeping husk. Unlucky. This clock also depicts your system time, so maybe it's a good thing that it dies. The main objective of this level is to transport a massive payload with Hakita inside. I... I what is the lore reason exactly? Why the, why the fuck is Hakita nuke again? So remember the two mini bosses I mentioned before? Yeah, let's talk about them. The gutter man and the gutter tank. And whilst these enemies may look really cool, they are the worst fucking bunch I've ever had to witness in my life. They are like dozens of these guys, and at some point you gotta fight literally 20 of them at once in a small little room. I want to commit infinite Oyasumi. So essentially, these guys are tremendously strong, especially if you don't realize that you can use your red hand to blow away at their shield. And I did not realize that, and I had significantly harder time. The Gutterman specifically are very interesting in the sense that they look old, rigid, almost degraded, far from the futuristic sexy robot dolls. Well, there's a good reason for that. The Gutterman were the first ever battle automatons. They were made at the beginning stages of the final war, where humanity mostly fought with trench warfare similar to World War I. Speaking of that, the final war in Ultra Kill is essentially World War I, but extended for centuries. In our history, the war ended in just a few years, but in Ultra Kill, it kept on escalating and escalating until robots like this became robots like this. <laughs> Hagida coincidentally aligned the German Schlieffen plan, which was the automated response to French invasion, with Ultra Kill's war becoming fully automated. Happy coincidences. I wasn't joking. Hakita is blessed by God himself despite all the blasphemies. Also, remember at the beginning of the video about how I mentioned Gustav Holt's Mars the Bringer of War being the soundbite used at the beginning of Ultra Kill? Well, yeah. Do you also remember how it became the official OST for World War I? Yeah, now it has quite a large significance for the story, doesn't it? During the early stages of the final war, Gutterman were specifically invented to flesh out humans out of the trenches and into the raging machine guns. These things were the first ever robots powered off of blood as well, and they even have a living human inside, just in case it can find its next Big Mac. This is around the point where humanity realized that they didn't need to actually be on the battlefield. They can just be on the sidelines as the robots did the heavy lifting. But for automation to occur, a counter needed to be made. And thus, the gutter tank were invented, starting off the second phase of the final war. If we look closely at the gutterman, we can actually see Cyrillic writing. The meaning of the writing was confirmed by Hakita to be Chilaviek Tank, which means human tank. Other robots, such as the gutter tank and earth mover, have German and Japanese writing, signifying their own origins. Aside from the obvious implications, Hakida wanted to really describe to us how the final war is everyone versus everyone. There were no sides like World War II, this was just chaos, and as a result, sooner or later, the war lost its purpose. The following section was the worst thing I ever had to experience in my life, second only to the, uh, the Bandicoot incident. I had to fend off the entire German Reich, and I want to die. A good level design out the window, right? I can Right, <laughs> Welcome to the third level of violence. This level is probably the most disturbing level in the whole of Ultra Kill, as it directly takes inspiration from the Suicide Forest from Divine Comedy. Really? Oh god, really? fucking Logan is about to pop in, idea. piss off. Within Dante's Inferno, every human that commits self-oof is sent directly into this specific area of violence. Within Divine Comedy, violence is also split between different areas. Some areas punish sinners who commit violence on others, and this specific area punishes those sinners who committed violence on themselves. As to why the punishment is so cruel is because, from Dante, the writer's perspective, a human committing suicide is tantamount to the biggest betrayal you could possibly do, because God was gracious enough to give you the gift of life, and you committing suicide is you actively saying no to that gift and rejecting God himself. Thus, he did the necessary to... Uh, condemn you to eternal tree suffering. 
Okay, okay, relax, you don't need your base 63 decoder, because the text you see on the wall is simply the Book of Revelations, or rather, the oldest written Greek text for the Book of Revelations. To read it, you'll need the knowledge of former Constantinople and a tremendous amount of faith. On the right, you can see a secret, but you can't access it right now, it's still under development. But if you still want to get inside, you just need to grab a street cleaner who would proceed to burn away the rubble. I'm curious on what abominations Hakito will put in this time. And this level is very open, you can just run around and have fun until you realize your uncle's watching you. Whilst you're not getting a heart attack, you can also come across a fight club, where a bunch of husks and robots are fighting each other. Huh, we've never actually seen that before. If you want to become the center of attention, like the least toxic LA influencer, you can grab this rock and mark yourself for death, which basically means that everyone will decide to go after that robo -giat. But there is something particular here. Red text pops up whenever you approach the crystal. Interesting, because up until this point, Red writing appeared only twice before, and it will appear two more times, with tremendous amount of significance. Once you come across the first tree of life, red text appears, demanding you to feed it blood. Interesting, because something like this never happened before, a direct order from an invisible being. It basically asks you to take part in the most peaceful American school project, and once you finish your work, this rotting tree will bloom in crimson, radiating this red aura. I really felt smug when I first saw this level, cause I'm like, oh, ooga booga, look, these things named puppets in the game files are actually just reused assets from old Ultra Kill logs, and then Hakita just states that himself. Cool. But there is one specific question that arises here. Why are the primordial sources of power, three of them, present inside hell? For such a valuable resource to be in hell makes you wonder, what other things does hell have? Does this mean hell uses these trees as a living source of power? Maybe this is why God wasn't able to beat it, cause it uses three of these trees to power its own abomination. It would make sense if hell is fueled by blood, cause every living creature is, so I guess we'll find that out in the deeper layers. But now, it's time for the climax, the earth mover often referred to as the Horsemen of the Apocalypse and the Centaurs. But that's not the boss, by the way. That's the whole fucking level. And the best part is, you can skip it! 90% of it! The creation of the Earthmovers initiated the final era of the final war, which almost annihilated most of humanity. Off in the distance you can see other Earthmovers, but that's it. There is nothing else to be seen. The Earthmovers are the pinnacle of human engineering, a colossal tool of mass destruction that single-handedly caused billions of souls to flood into hell every minute. These things fire off lasers that can obliterate cities in seconds and they are impervious from external damage. This is what the Ferryman's Diary was talking about, by the way. What caused the river Styx to become a massive ocean was these things. The Earth Movers are so massive that they have to essentially use two power sources, solar panels and blood. This very design would spell the end of Earth Movers and the end of humans' life above Earth. The constant destruction and war caused soot, smoke and decay to block out the sun, casting the world into the long night. Earth Movers not being able to feed off of the sun died out one by one. And as a result, war ended not on a massive bang, but rather on a whimper. I continued yapping about this for way too long, so sh long story short, humans became friends, they decided to go underground, and they started to heal Earth. Yippee, Yippee! very nice. Then they decided to ruin everything by delving into forces they did not know what the fuck they were doing by delving into hell. Very cool. And then I also continued to yap about how in Divine Comedy, the centaurs are also literally shooting people who are burning up in a boiling river of blood as to prevent them from escaping the river of blood. Very fucking cool of me. I just had another revelation. I'm not gonna act surprised because I wrote this script like two weeks ago, so it's not a recent one anyway. But here's the thing, what you're looking at is not something divine, all-powerful, or anything like that. It's actually your prey. V1 was made towards the end of the final war, and V2 was made right after that, which is why they share so many similarities while being so different. If these things were made in the final stage of the final war, it would imply that V1, V1 at Shad Thundercock, was specifically made to take this thing down. You are the predator, and what you're looking at is your natural prey. That's so fucking sick. 
Up until this point when I was trying to research for this video and write my schizophrenia about it, I was always wondering as to how humanity was able to find hell. Once I decided to delve into Dante's Inferno thanks to Windigoon, I came to a conclusion that hell, just like within Dante's Inferno, is located under the Earth's surface. This would also coincide with how humanity discovered hell once they didn't have any room on the surface and could only continue digging downwards. This video is way too fucking long, so let me just shorten down the final 20 or so minutes of my recording into something less schizophrenic. After you defeat the centaur's brain, which has one of the developers inside, I don't know why, but it is very cute, it's a little puppy, you essentially finish the level. That's all that there is to it. But there is one more thing to this level, and that is this very unique book which is written in all red text. The text scholar, which is mainly red, along with its very unique wordage, makes a lot of people believe that it is hell, and I also think it is hell. It gives us such very interesting descriptions about the final war, and more specifically the centaurs, and even how the war could not have ended any other way. This was destined from the beginning. A machine that was created to stop the war would ultimately continue the war. It was a perpetual cycle of torment until every single side was destroyed. And it was right. Due to the things we discussed before, and especially the significance of every single line of dialogue which was read, I think it is safe to say that this book genuinely is hell. Which is kinda terrifying because it is very, very intelligent. Not to mention poetic. The book talks about the final war, but it does not talk about its direct involvement with humanity. So whether or not humanity survived and was able to contain hell is still up in the air. I guess I'll uh, make another 30 minute long video discussing the last two levels of Ultra Kill in like a year. So yeah, I missed out on a lot of things, but I do not care anymore. This video was way too fucking long. Bye bye now.